Welcome everyone to our third uh, consortium event, USC Consortium for Gender, Sexuality, Race, and Public Culture event this semester. And uh, just a little bit about the consortium, I wanted to tell you all. Um, the consortium began as a faculty-led initiative where a group of faculty working on issues related to popular and public culture were going to get together and do, you know, share research and think about how we share that research with the public. We began in February 2020. So if you think about the timing of that, <laughs> that wasn't necessarily the ideal time to be planning these programs that we were going to have uh, uh, unfurl over the course of that year. So we undertook uh, what people call a pandemic pivot. And that pandemic pivot involved doing podcasts. And uh, this is part of why we have our guest here today. But one of the things that uh, we did was we kind of thought about, OK, well, how do we transpose our research to the public? What ways can we still share our ideas and still connect with folks um, even if we can't be together in person? So the consortium grew from there. And now that we've returned to in-person events, we still continue our podcast network. And we invite you to look up what we're up to at USC Consortium on Twitter as well as on Instagram, where we're live streaming this event today. And it gives me tremendous pleasure to be hosting this conversation with a friend, collaborator, just an all around wonderful person, Karina Longworth, who you may know is the host of and producer, writer of You Must Remember This, a, fil a noted film critic, book author, a general contributor to culture. There was a recent major profile in the Rolling Stone uh, featuring Karina. And today we're going to just sit and really have a conversation about what it takes and what kind of research it takes to do something like a podcast. And also how research, uh, whatever research it is that you perform, is, can be transposed to different publics and different audiences. Um, but we're also going to learn a lot about Karina's process. So I'm going to just sidle up here. Um, please welcome Karina Lawler. Thank you. Thanks to everybody for coming. And thank you, Karen, for that introduction. Well, thanks. So you know, um, one of the biggest, I think, misconceptions, or maybe it's not a misconception, but certainly it's one that attends to podcasts when we think about your average dude bro podcast, mm -hmm. is that all it takes is a little Wikipedia. And you could just chat about whatever it is you <laughs> want for you know, anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes, and people will listen to it. And whereas that maybe has borne out in certain instances, this is a very kind of different approach that you've taken with You Must Remember This. So I just want to set that as the kind of framing for the discussion. Mm -hmm. and, but I want to take you, us back a little bit to your story and how you became interested in or involved in cinema and how so often our research interests are forged from our fandoms. Mm -hmm. So you want telling us a little bit about what drew you to cinema, what turned you eventually into a cinephile, and then how your researches began before you maybe even knew it. Yeah, sure. Um, well, you know, I'm kind of a late Gen X kid and, um, you know, raised by parents who were sort of too busy to be around. Um, and so I found myself entertaining myself quite a bit by going to libraries, by watching TV, getting dropped off at the movies and staying for three movies, um, going to the video store. Um, and, you know, some of those are kind of outdated concepts now, but um, back then it, like, I just felt this voracious appetite for, for entertainment and for culture and for learning more about the things that I was watching. Um, and so I, I ended up going to art school for college, um, partially because I was interested in making visual things, but also because I was extremely not interested in science and math. <laughs> and um, you know, I don't know if it's different now, but at that time in high school, you could kind of stop with science and math classes at a certain point if you knew you were going to a school that didn't require the upper levels. And so I kind of set my sights on these art schools. And, and something that happened when I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago was that I found myself enjoying my, my art making classes, but being kind of more drawn to the classes that were about the history of film, art, fashion, popular culture, you know, classes about people like Walter Benjamin, who were 
um, reflecting their time, but also kind of thinking theoretically and critically about media making. Um, and I started bringing that into the art I was making. And so I was making these videos that were largely, they were kind of personal diaries. I was using a lot of found footage, um, images from movies and TV shows that I was editing together. Um, but it was almost entirely about looking at my own life through the lens of things I was watching. Um, and then I, there wasn't really a place for those videos at that time. I graduated um, undergraduate in 2003 and there was no YouTube yet. Um, the art world didn't really get it. The film festival world wasn't interested because I was using you know, basically stolen footage. <laughs> so um, I was kind of trying to figure out you know, how do I take these interests and put them somewhere else? And I ended up going to graduate school at NYU and getting a master's degree in cinema studies and then becoming a film critic. Um, but I, I've, I you know, worked as a film critic and generally writing about new movies from about 2005 to about 2013, but mm -hmm. I think I was always trying to get back to that idea of, of going into the archive and like going into film history. There's a book that you referred to. I, I noticed like in your, uh, in a uh, recent thing you did for The Strategist, right? Like mm -hmm. you know, kind of essential items. You referred to the book A Star is Born, The Making of the 1954 Movie, and it's 1983 restoration as a kind of I don't know, a, a kind of jumping off point, a kind of inspirational text or totem for you. Could you just yeah. say a little bit more about that? So I discovered that book. I, I had um, a couple of jobs when I, in my last few years of college. One was working in a video store and another was working at the Virgin Megastore. And I was working very specifically in the book department at the Virgin Megastore, which most of you guys are probably too young to have ever been to a Virgin <laughs> Megastore, but um, they tended to have really great book departments that focused on books about music, movies, things like that. And so I, I had discovered the movie A Star is Born working at the video store because I had gone through this project of taking home every movie that was on two VHS tapes <laughs> because it seemed like those were the long movies and long movies must be important movies. And so I had really fallen in love with this, this film made in 1954 and, and the version of it that was available then, which is not very much different from the most recent restoration, which is available now, has basically about 35 minutes missing from the original theatrical version because um, the studio Warner Brothers was not satisfied with how it was doing at the box office in its first weekend. So they pulled the movie from release, cut out kind of at random a large chunk of the movie, and then put it back into release. And then they apparently threw away the footage that they cut out. And so as this movie was kind of being rediscovered and re-celebrated years later, a man named Ronald Haver, who was running the film um, program at the LA County Museum of Art at the time, he went looking for that lost material. And he never found the lost images, but he did find a complete soundtrack from the theatrical version. So if you watch this movie now, even today, there's a section of the movie that's all still images. Um, and a lot of people don't know the story behind that, and so they watch the film and think it's extremely avant-garde. Um, <laughs> but um, when I discovered that movie and fell in love with it at the video store, shortly after that I was working at, in the books section at the Virgin Megastore, and I found that book. And that allowed me to, to you know, take this thing that I'd recently discovered and kind of become obsessed with and, and understand it in, from a creative point of view, but also a historic point of view. And it just, it made me really fascinated about the idea that this can't be the only film that has a story like this. And it can't be the only object in popular culture that has a story that brings together not just the creative and, and entertainment, but stories about economics and social issues and, um, you know, the history of the business. And so I, I became excited about looking for those stories. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, you know, the, the kind of, just thinking about like the, energies that are activated when you come across a text like that or when you start getting into movies or things like that. That's kind of one of the things that I wanted us to touch upon here is just how research can almost happen accidentally or be motivated by, as I kind of said in the first question, like a fandom or, mm -hmm. or a kind of growing interest. And, and at a certain point, one builds their own archives at the same time that they begin you know, consulting official archives. Mm -hmm. And I know that you must remember this touches upon both and has certainly taken, you know, advantage of both the Herrick libraries, the film archives, and 
also a bunch of magazines, let's say, that you've had over the course of time. I think one of my greatest pleasures in following you on Instagram is seeing what you know, magazines you're revisiting or exploring and using basically a whole range of materials that count as research or that become an important part of that um, archive or the background for what you're doing. Just sort of wanted to invite you to kind of think about like, you know, when would you say that you became your own kind of amateur archivist <laughs> around the movies that you loved and why in particular were older movies, right? So mm -hmm. Hollywood's first century, something that you were particularly drawn to. Well, certainly I, I do collect magazines now and I use them as research materials. Um, and that definitely comes out of fandom of being a fan in the 90s when I was a teenager and being a subscriber to Entertainment Weekly from the age of 12 on and um, you know, really getting almost like a high off of learning um, advanced information about movies that were going to come out. Um, and I also subscribed to Spin Magazine, and I feel like I learned a lot about writing from rock and roll magazines and from the sort of attitude towards culture that was a little bit more um, sarcastic and a little bit more skeptical than um, some of the, the media coming out about movies. And so I didn't actually keep any of those magazines that I accumulated in the 90s. I mean, when I moved out of my dad's house to go to college when I was 18, I left all that kind of stuff behind and he just threw it away, <laughs> which is frustrating. Um, but over the years, I, I, basically ever since I started doing the podcast, I've started um, kind of picking one magazine at a time to look for on eBay. Um, and, and that actually started because I wanted to write about the history of Confidential Magazine, which was a tabloid. It was basically one of the first real success stories of a magazine being about Hollywood and, and people who made movies, but being at opposition to the studios, publishing things that the studios didn't want out there. Um, and they, had, they got their information by using mostly private detectives. Um, and sometimes uh, publicists, agents, studios could pay off Confidential to um, avoid having things getting in print. Sometimes they would trade a story about a star that wasn't as important to hide something about somebody who was important. Um, and so I really wanted to kind of get to know that material, but I searched and searched and searched and couldn't find a library that had a complete collection of confidential. And so I figured, like, maybe I'll just make my own. Mm -hmm. um, and that led me on this path of being like, you know, something that's a lot easier than going to a place and looking for something and maybe not being able to find it is to just be able to spend five dollars on eBay to buy it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of, you know not every magazine that I have acquired costs only five dollars, but um, <laughs> it's it's kind of a, an, a manageable addiction and a very useful one. And certainly it has inspired um, some of the more recent seasons of my podcast because the ma and the material is right there in my house, um, and that was very useful when I was thinking up ideas um, for the podcast since the pandemic. I think I veered away from your question. No, I mean, but, the, but this is the whole thing, is that the question yeah. is a starting point, and it's okay to veer away. But, you know, and, and, and I think, I, and I do definitely want to get into the unique character mm -hmm. of the most recent season of You Must Remember This, Erratic 80s, mm -hmm. and getting deeper into the 20th century, really, because mm -hmm. I think that, um, I mean, you know, we, I, get, I guess, you know, we've been slow, sort of slowly marching towards the you know, 80s, and then you're working on erotic 90s. Yeah. Um, but I did want to step back a little bit too around like the kind of trajectory that you were in, where your interest brought you. Because you mm -hmm. said you went to grad school in film school, right? At, or it was cinema studies. So cinema it was studies. history, theory, criticism. Yeah, at, at NYU. And a lot of the time, and especially for folks of our particular generation, getting masters at that level, you end up saying, oh, I might as well go to grad school yeah. a little more and maybe mm -hmm. consider, because you know, one of the things that struck me just be even before I met you and when I just first listened to your show is the kind of, there is a scholarly sensibility. There's a real kind of, mm -hmm. um, you know, accountability to the archive that, as I kind of mentioned up top, you don't get in a lot of popular, and it's hugely popular podcasts, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you know, and I was wondering what made you decide, okay, I'll be a film critic instead of continuing on in academia in some way or, or a historian who goes and does more research and does a PhD and that whole thing. And, and you know, just because one of the things that the consortium does is we kind of consider present to 
young scholars different paths for their right. research energies. So I just wanted to invite. I wish yeah. somebody had presented different paths to me. Um, uh -huh. uh, so I, I was in a two-year program at NYU where there was a terminal master's degree, and I could have reapplied to get a continue on and get a PhD. And there was a couple of things that prevented me from doing that. Um, one was that I didn't feel I didn't feel at home in that program. Um, I was not very good at writing in an academic style that hid my voice and my mm -hmm. opinions. Um, and I also started getting work while I was still in school writing about new movies. Um, so that path was kind of opened up for me. And then the other thing that kept me from applying for a PhD is that specific program had a language requirement where you had to prove fluency or proficiency in a language that was not English, and I had nothing. Um, and so I would have had to at least take some time off to you know, learn French or Italian or something. But it seems, even though that would probably be useful in life, it didn't seem that useful for my research because I knew I was only interested in the Hollywood studio system of the 20th century. Um, so I felt like, you know, you, you could always go back to school, but at that moment I had an opportunity to, you know, sort of write for money about contemporary cinema, and so I chose that. Um, but as I said, like, I, I got to a point where I was really burnt out on being a film critic and having to have an opinion on every single new thing that was coming out. And that's when I started trying to find a way back into the history of Hollywood and, and back into the archive. Mm -hmm. And that is the origin story of You Must Remember This, which mm -hmm. began in 2014, right? And mm -hmm. it was sort of like the saturation point of having a take. Yeah. Um, and, and the kind of, I guess, spending time with material and crafting a narrative. So I'd like to invite you to just talk about how in the early days of the podcast, you found your way to your process. What did the process look like at the beginning in 2014 mm -hmm. when you started doing this podcast and putting those research energies in here? What was, how did you prepare the script, et cetera? So I had moved back to Los Angeles in 2010 to take a job at the LA Weekly as a critic and editor. And 80% of that job was writing about new movies, but I was also able, when there was a retrospective series in town or a new um, home video release of something exciting where the, there was a director or somebody being made available for interviews, I was able to write about those things too. And so I started getting in the habit of going to the Margaret Herrick Library, which is the Academy's library, and doing these deep dives on those subjects um, and just really loving it and, and feeling much more inspired by that than I was inspired by these new movies. So when I decided to quit my job as a critic, I was basically in search of some way where I could just do that research for my job. <laughs> and I, I did a couple of books for hire. Um, I did a book about Meryl Streep and one about Al Pacino that was allowing me to kind of do those, that research, do those deep dives on one single person and their body of work, which I really enjoyed. Um, but it, you know, these books for hire, you know, I think I was paid something like $3,000 for each one, and it was many, many months of work, and it just wasn't a sustainable salary. Um, and I was not at the level at that point where I could get a book agent and sell a more lucrative book. And, you know, I just I felt like I had something to say, and I had, I knew that my research skills were strong, and I needed to create a platform where I could prove that to people. And at the same time, I was listening to podcasts more than I was reading blogs or more than I was reading magazines at that point. You know, that it was, I think all of the American film magazines had pretty much died off, except for magazines about independent film at that point. Um, and so I, I just was like, you know, I don't think anybody would be upset if I started a podcast <laughs> because it's not like there is a podcast that sounds like, the, what I would do that would be doing the kind of research that I would be doing. Um, so at the very least, I just thought nobody would be too annoyed by it existing. And I wasn't thinking at that point that the podcast would be this thing that would be the way I made a living. I thought maybe it could be a calling card so that I, it could lead to something else. You know, Maybe I would get a book deal, or maybe I could convince like Turner Classic Movies to let me work for them. or. Criterion or something like that. I think that was the hashtag goal of the moment was TCM, <laughs> right? I think from reading yeah. in at least one of the interviews that uh, your recent interviews. Mm -hmm. But also it's interesting that you're mentioning that because there was a the kind of blog to film criticism pipeline that mm -hmm. you also undertook. And then right. as you mentioned, the podcast became the kind of calling card mm 
or you imagined it I'm, was going yeah, to be Yeah, I imagined it, but then it has, very quickly it became a full-time job. Yeah, and, and so describe for us then, you know, um, maybe that first season and like when you started realizing just how much it took to create each episode. Like typically back then, I'm, I'm sure that the efficiency of each season and each process has changed over the course of time, because I'm gonna ask you what it's like to <laughs> make it now versus what it was like to make it then. But but give us just a little glimpse at like, say like what an, a life, um, you know, however it was, a week in the life of an episode. Right. At the very beginning, I wasn't even thinking of it as seasons. I was just trying to see, like teach myself how to do it mm -hmm. and, you know, sort of fit it in with other things I was doing in my life. and. Um, I would say that that changed after about three or four episodes when it, the show started getting press, mm -hmm. which was a huge surprise. And then it, I was like, well, people are paying attention. <laughs> and so I felt even more of a burden to make sure that their research was as solid as it could be and that, you know, the show was, that I was doing the best job I could do in general. And, and, and so... Um, those first episodes, you know, there was no schedule for when they'd come out. I would just kind of work on them as hard as I could until I felt they were done. And and I was also editing them myself. I was doing everything myself. The research, the writing, the speaking, choosing all the clips and things, choosing all the music. I did not know that I, well, I kind of knew that I shouldn't be stealing copyrighted music, <laughs> but I didn't think it, it, there would be any real reason not to because, again, I sort of come from this 90s, culture jamming point of view that's that's what really uh, informed like the work I was doing in art school where um, you're sort of subverting and making fun of the dominant culture by stealing bits and pieces of it um, and so I wanted to have that element to this show um, but what ended up happening was after I'd done about eight or nine episodes I was approached by some people from American public media um, who were putting together a podcast network. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, if you can really do this on a weekly schedule, we'd like you to be part of our podcast network and, and we'll sell ads for you. And so at that point, I decided to kind of stop doing these other freelance things that I was doing and really focus and see if I could make this my job. Mm -hmm. um, so then it went from being this thing where it's like, I'll just put out an episode whenever I'm ready to put out an episode to I have to figure out how to make one of these every week. And how did you transform the research process mm -hmm. based on switching from the your kind of schedule of when I feel it's done, it's mm -hmm. done, to now I'm doing this weekly? Did you already do a bulk of the research before, or were you having to pick some up per episode? So that's what I was doing before the American public media thing was I would just start from scratch completely every week. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I'd go to the library and pull a book off the shelf and be like, oh, Val Luden, I find him interesting. I'll do an episode <laughs> about him. Or I'd be on IMDb and it would be, you know, almost Isabella Rossellini's 50th birthday. And so I'd be like, oh, I wonder if I could do an episode about Isabella Rossellini, you know, in the 10 days before her birthday and release it then. Um, but then now that I had to be on this schedule, what I realized really fast was that I couldn't just start from scratch every week. I had to have these kind of overarching ideas so that there'd be interlocked stories. Um, and that would be the only way the research would be managed, so manageable. So that's when I started thinking of it as seasons mm -hmm. um, and being like, well, this specific topic or framework of topics could produce, let's say, 12 episodes and so I'll just knock out all of this research to do these 12 episodes, and then I'll take a break. And then, you know, a few weeks later or a few months later, I'll come back with another set of episodes about a different topic. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that um, I'm, you know, that the podcast is super impressive around is, is thinking through topics that you think you might know or understand or where there's a kind of peak saturation around the, the discussion point in culture, you think, but then you find these other angles or entry points into them. I'm thinking of like one of the more popular seasons of the Manson mm -hmm. season, for example. How do you, because this is also a conundrum that faces scholars and researchers of any kind. It's like, you know, there is nothing new under the sun. It's sort of like, you know, the, the terror in one's heart when, when you see that someone else is writing on your topic or what have you. So how is it that you figured out, you know, as, 
you know, an entry point mm -hmm. into something that had been so worked over and that radiated out through so many spheres of culture from, you know, the white, you know, like the, the, the white album vis-a-vis -vis <laughs> the Manson family to yeah. the books to the, you know, all the numerous cinematic uh, retellings of that story. So I came to the Manson story not out of any interest in Manson or true crime or murder or anything like that. I came to it because I was watching Turner Classic Movies one night <laughs> and they were showing a bunch of Dor Doris Day movies. And I was thinking to myself, well, I don't actually know that much about Doris Day. And so I pulled up her Wikipedia profile and I think there was you know, one sentence about, and her son, Terry Melcher, formerly owned the house at Cielo Drive where the Manson murders took place and some believe that he was the real target. Mm -hmm. And that was something that I had never heard before. And so, you know, that led me down a rabbit hole of reading about Terry Melcher. And then that led me to the Beach Boys. And um, just it was just sort of like one domino after another accumulating that made this story of Charles Manson, which I had never been interested in, more interesting to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it really just felt like if you could connect Doris Day to Charles Manson with one person in between, there's a story here that nobody thinks of when they think of Charles Manson. Um, and then I read a book called Manson, I think it's called Manson, His Life and Times by Jeff Wynn, which had come out a few years before and is just a beautifully researched, comprehensive book about Manson that really puts him in the context of, of where he grew up, how he grew up, the socioeconomic stuff. Um, and the time period and how he was able to kind of go into places. This guy who was a career criminal, had put, done several stints in prison, um, no formal education, how he was able to pick up things from all these different places and then go into spaces like, you know, like recording studios in Los Angeles and sort of charm his way through. Um, and so, yeah, it, to me it was, it wasn't looking for a new way into Manson. It was sort of finding a piece of information and realizing it was a new way into Manson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and also that, um, and this is where I think, you know, we can kind of get into some of the, the, like, how gender plays into the subjects or topics that you tackle, because mm -hmm. that new way in was, of course, through Doris Day, right? right? And through somebody who, you know, people don't think of in that kind of framework or even in that period of history as much, right. right? And so I just sort of wanted to, you know, invite you to talk about when you saw, especially like the most recent season, Erotic 80s, it really is a kind of treatise on gender politics in Hollywood and the Gossip Girls season as well. Um, I, I, I just sort of want to think about like how, to what extent, you know, you then began to see these arcs through um, gender in particular and through, you know, the figures who may have been, you know, couched as ancillary to these, these larger masculine figures or more notorious masculine figures. Well, I think, I think that something that I've always been interested in is this idea, and I wrote about this a little bit in my book about Howard Hughes, which is really about 10 actresses he was involved with. Um, this idea that like the female body is kind of one of the raw materials of cinema. Um, and at the same time, as, as a young woman growing up being really fascinated by movies, I was never able to picture myself as a director or um, as somebody who would have power in the film industry, just because that didn't seem visible to me. Um, and as I've gotten older, I guess I've gotten a little bit angrier about that. Um, and have really wanted to understand why, you know, why is it, you know, I remember being 20 years old and reading Laura Mulvey's um, visual pleasure and narrative cinema and really pushing back against this idea that all cinema is about the male gaze, you know, objectifying women and, and feeling like that excludes female viewers. But at the same time, it, she's right too, <laughs> you know what I mean? She's, she's not, She's not telling the entirety of the story of what it's like to watch a movie for everyone, but she does make points. Um, and so, yeah, I just kind of wanted to know more about um, the ways in which the industry itself at a level of 
of bureaucracy and day-to-day -day function kind of enforce different gender roles. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's not, it's not just that like women are sex objects and men are doing the objectifying, you know. Women have, there's a, a long storied history of women as screenwriters, as editors, um, and all of that stuff, I think, ha if anything, has been underreported. Um, but there, it, still, there is kind of a primary relationship of men behind the camera and women in front of the camera. And so that's something that I think the is... The Polly Platt season was really wonderful around that. Certainly. I mean, Polly Platt, for people who don't know, was married to the director, Peter Bogdanovich, and worked with him as a co-writer, as a producer, as a production designer, doing hair and makeup. Um, but for various reasons on a lot of their films in which they were collaborators, she didn't get full credit for all of those jobs. And then um, after he left her for a young actress, she continued to work with him because their creative collaboration was so fertile, but in some ways it kind of, um, it kind of crippled her from being able to have the full career that she possibly could have had, you know, under different circumstances. Um, but yeah, so there, there, is like a, there is a huge history of women contributing to movies in ways other than being sort of a, a visual presence. Um, and so that, that's always something I want to talk about, but I also want to talk about like why why it didn't happen more. Mm -hmm. Which brings us sort of to the erotic 80s season and the most recent season. And as the uh, pandemic-driven season, too, that I know that you've spoken a little bit about how your part of your research process was altered because you couldn't get into archives, et cetera, and how that influenced your choice of topic, erotic 80s. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and also, um, a little bit about erotic 90s, which is, I, I know you're working on, and which, mm -hmm. you know, this is what, what actually inspired me to invite you to come for this conversation is when I saw, you know, in when you posted the kind of image of your script for the erotic 90s season, and it had, it was already like something like 90,000 words <laughs> or something like that, which is about the, the length of a substantial academic mm -hmm. monograph, right? <laughs> and, you know, I think about, uh, you know, just, those of us who in the publisher perish mode, right? Yeah. Like think about like all of that work that that goes into it, um, and 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 so I was just like, actually, you know, all that research that goes into the season of the pod, mm -hmm. that's that's a whole monograph's worth of work. So I just yeah, you know, that's part of why I started. <laughs> but tell us a little bit about erotic '80s, and mm -hmm. then we'll get into erotic '90s. Yeah. So basically, the in March 2020, when public spaces shut down, I was nearing the end of the research about the polyplot season. Luckily, I had already gone to a couple of different places in person to look at papers and stuff that would not have been available to me after March 2020. Um, but then when it came to figuring out what the next seasons would be, I really, at first I thought I have to just base, I need to come up with topics that can be based around very well-researched books that I have access to. Mm -hmm. And so that led to the Gossip Girl season, which is kind of more about, it's about Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons, who were um, very important gossip columnists in early Hollywood. But even more than that, it's kind of about the relationship between Hollywood and newspapers. Um, and so there was a lot of sources that I could consult about that. The next season after that I did was about Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. There's so many books about both of them and the rap hack. Um, but particularly, there's an incredible book about um, Dean Martin called Dino by Nick Toshes. And if anything, I just wanted to draw more people's attention to that book. Um, and then Erotic 80s came out of a couple things. One was that in the spring of 2020, as my husband and I were home alone every night <laughs> um, trying to entertain ourselves, we found ourselves drawn to movies from the 80s and 90s that one of us or both of us hadn't seen. And so I ended up watching either for the first time or revisiting a lot of the movies that um, I talked about in Erotic 80s and we'll be talking about in Erotic 90s. The other thing is that I had already been building this magazine collection. And so one of the magazines that I had been buying um, was called Movie Line, which was big in the late 80s, but really flourished in the 90s. It was a monthly um, film industry magazine that I, I said before that I was, I feel like I learned how to write from reading Spin Magazine, and mm -hmm. it's sort of like sarcastic, um, very hipper than thou take on things. Movie line was that for the movie industry to the extent that some of it, its articles were just pure satire, but <laughs> unmarked as such. Um, there's, a, like, for instance, there's an article. I'm trying to actually get in touch with the guy who wrote it, um, who seems to have disappeared from the internet. But um, he wrote 
the he wrote under a pseudonym called Christopher Hunt, who was like sort of a, a very like tacky, um, nouveau, hip Hollywood screenwriter. <laughs> and there's a piece he wrote, I think, in the summer of 1993 about why Christopher Hunt had to go into exile because he was falsely <laughs> accused of, of sexual harassment. Um, and so that kind of thing is like, I, it's sort of crazy that that exists alongside kind of like serious profiles of movie stars and directors, but it did. Um, and so I, I again, it, a part of erotic 80s and now erotic 90s is just about me like reading these magazines, collecting these magazines, and wanting people to know about them. Yeah, and um, and that's, you know, and it is, super, one of the things that strikes me about the research process too, it's not just about like reading the primary articles in, you know, say Movie Line or what have you, or Entertainment Weekly, or Playboy, or what have you, but looking at the advertising, looking mm. at the cult cultural incidentals that formed or shaped, you know, maybe the kind of primary topic at hand. Yeah, I mean, I, th I actually, I relate it to the way Instagram works now. So, you yeah. know, you open up your phone and you have your feed and you have the accounts you follow, which are probably a combination of people you know, people you don't know, uh, famous people and, you know, corporations or brands. And then interspersed throughout that are, is advertising that's been curated for you based on these things that you do follow possibly also based on conversations you're having in real life because your phone is listening to you. Yeah. Um, and that is actually not that different from the way these magazines worked, where there was an assumption of your tastes based on which magazine you were buying. Um, and everything was sort of curated to fit that demographic that you fit. Um, and so when you open up one of these magazines, whether it's you know Playboy or Movie Line or Entertainment Weekly or whatever it is, part of the experience is flipping through these ads and seeing, you know, the the fashion in the editorial, but also the fashion in the ads for Smirnoff, mm -hmm. um, and it's and it's about like different types, of, like seeing technology tracked over the years based on what kind of stereo you're they're trying to sell you, and you know when they switch from selling you cassette tapes to selling you burnable DVDs and. Mm -hmm and all of that. So yeah, I find the whole thing to be a really interesting way of getting a snapshot of a very specific moment in time um, and how that moment of time was being presented to a specific demographic. And that makes it into the scripts of the podcast, which mm -hmm. is, you know, which is part of where I, I call it cultural studies research, right? <laughs> because that, that is, you know, where you know, not only, again, look at the primary sources, but the kind of cultural detritus, right? Yeah. Or detritus, however you want to pronounce that. But like, you know, yeah. um, and, and you can composite, you know, a sense of, for example, you know, how a certain kind of fabric was of, you know, of popular or of note or signified something alluring in the era of American gigolo or what have you, mm -hmm. right? You know, so, um, so I do appreciate that. Again, it's sort of like being inspired by Doris Day and getting to a Manson story. It's, it's like, you know, um, being inspired by a Smirnoff ad and finding some way of making commentary on gender representation more broadly. Yeah, I mean, moment. an example that just came to my head was that the last episode of Erotic 80s is largely about Rob Lowe and his sex tape scandal from 1989. And there was, I can't remember if it was People or, I think it was People Magazine, where there was just a huge cover story where they, you know, went and interviewed the women involved. They interviewed the, like, the people at the nightclub and everyone who ever met any of these people, basically. <laughs> it was many, many pages, 25 pages or something. And on one, in part of the story, there was, you know, the commentary that, um, in this sex tape, like he does not use a condom. Mm -hmm. And on the opposite page, there's an ad for Magnum condoms. <laughs> it's, like exa it's exactly what is happening on Instagram right now, where it's like you express interest in something and then that product is sold to you. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Well, I think this is a good moment to actually open the floor to some questions if you're sure. cool with that. So if anybody has any questions or comments, um, pink shirt mask. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So I've been listening from the very beginning, and I absolutely love it. Thank you. You've, your format has stayed really consistent, and I'm wondering if you played around with it at the very beginning, or you just went with it and it, and it worked. Um, I mean, I have played around with it a little bit. I mean, there are some early episodes where there are interviews, mm -hmm. um, and I did use more interviews in the Polly Platt season. Yeah. Um, but 
you know, I think that the kind of basic format, which is just me doing an enormous amount of research and then talking for a long time, <laughs> uh, writing a script that I read and that in which I, you know, work in areas to put movie clips and, you know, clips of whatever. I think that generally works and it's, it's kind of the format that I feel the most comfortable working in. And in the front, you had your hand up as well. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, a lot of podcasts now are doing like Patreons where they have like additional content and people pay for it. Have you ever considered doing something like that where you do share more about like all the stuff you don't include and all the research that doesn't, that gets cut? Um, just because it does sound like it is, you're consuming so much content and there's probably so much that goes into it that doesn't make it in. I do have a Patreon, and you I do do, do that oh. on my Patreon. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I and I, I actually like I've been um, the new season, Erotic Nineties. We thought we were going to launch in November, and now it looks like it's going to be March because it's twice as long as I thought it was going to be. I okay. thought it was going to be ten episodes, and now it looks like it's going to be twenty-one. Wow! Um, but so there is still an enormous amount of material that's not going to make it into the individual episodes. And right now, I'm actually trying to plan how to parse that out on. Patreon so that you can kind of get teases of it before the season that don't spoil the season. Got it. Yes. Hi, I just got to remember, how did you find your, uh, your advertisers or sponsors? So I've worked with... I've worked with a number of different podcast networks over time. I, I mentioned before that the first one was part of American Public Media, and then I've, I've made different deals with different podcast networks since then. And generally what they provide is that they put the podcast on all of the services like Apple Podcasts and Spotify and et cetera, et cetera. And in exchange for a cut of the ad revenue, they sell ads. So I have no involvement in selling ads on the podcast. All I can do is reject certain advertisers if I really don't believe in what they, you know, what they are selling. Front row in the dark. Um, I love that the Pally Flat season was Thank at you. the same time as the TCM season on Peter Bogdanovich. Mm -hmm. Is that just coincidence, or do you think that they heard about what you were doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as they told me, it was coincidence. Um, certainly, Peter and Polly's daughters knew that both things were happening. Did you know ahead of time, or? No. Well, I'm sure Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, I try to be very transparent about my own opinion about what I think is true and what I think is manipulated or exaggerated or, you know, just a pure PR story. And I think I, you know, the season I did called Gossip Girls, which is basically about um, media, about movies and media about Hollywood, gets into that stuff the most. In the back. Yeah. The thing that changed really was just the research because I've always done all my work at home except for going to research libraries. So um, I've never really worked in person with anybody. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Um, so I know in terms of researching, you will come across a lot of information sometimes in a very quick span of time. How do you go about your organizational process and in mm -hmm. terms of not getting well, I'd fail to not get overwhelmed with it often. Um, but, um, you know, there's I, sometimes different seasons demand different things. Um, but, you know, what I've been working on for the past year or so in terms of the 80s and then the 90s is that um, I've kind of, at the very beginning, made a list of all the movies that I can think of and find through preliminary research that I think would be interesting. And then I break it down to figure out, I wa you know, watch the ones that I haven't seen recently or have never seen and, like, from there, kind of weed some out and decide that some absolutely have to be in there. And then from there, I can kind of make a schedule for the season based on 
you know, which things I know I absolutely want to talk about. And then I start doing research about those subjects. And then I can create individual documents based on each subject. And then, you know, sometimes you kind of merge two movies into one episode or whatever it is. One thing that's been happening with Erotic 90s is that I, um, I thought I knew what I was doing. And as I was doing the research, I just kept coming across other movies or other genre, like subgenres or other ideas that I felt like had to be included. And that's why instead of being a 10 episode season, right now it's a 21 episode season. And it's, I think it's gonna take eight episodes to get through for, like, from 1990 to 1992 because there's just so much <laughs> happening in that period. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Over here, White Shirt. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask you about something contemporary and sort of welcome to like not having a massive engagement at, at a very deep level if you don't want to, but the discourse culture loop that we now have around movies and the kind of way that it's divisive. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned the 90s and kind of how it informed you and how it shaped you. I mean, now it feels like hard to sometimes understand or think about things because everyone is, is in the mix and there's a lot more space, which is also more inclusive. I just wonder how you read this moment in terms of film art and Yeah. You know, I don't pay that much attention to contemporary films, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I have been made aware of the discourse around Blonde. Um, and, you know, I think that, I don't think it's honestly that different from the discourse around movies like, say, Fatal Attraction, where not only did everybody with a platform weigh in, um, but the discourse unfolded over many months. Um, and took many different turns and was a lot about, you know, take the taking a side and then knocking down somebody else's point of view and all of that. I think what's different now is that I'm not sure anybody's actually watching the movies. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of conversation happening based on conversation and it's kind of getting pretty far away from the actual topic. I mean, I think most of the people who I saw weigh in on Blonde up until this past week had not seen the movie and were um, against it based on its rating or based on um, things that they had read either from people who had seen the movie or people who hadn't seen the movie. Um, now that the movie is out, I am, you know, it will be interesting to see how that evolves. Yes. Um, this is sort of adjacent to the uh, PR question, but I'm wondering how you sort of, your hierarchy of fact checking or, or, or how you decide if the is correct or not correct. I know some magazines are fact-checked, some older ones maybe not so much, and a lot of books aren't fact-checked. So how do you... I think there was much more fact-checking in the time period of, you know, I would say the 70s, 80s, 90s than there was either before or after. Um, I, when it comes to a book, I, if a book doesn't have sources, I don't take it very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can actually, you know, kind of look at the sources and determine based on that um, what level of seriousness to take it with. And then in terms of magazines and other publications, you know, I think that you have to read a lot in order to kind of understand um, how credible something is, you know. But, I mean, I think it is tricky and it, there isn't really an easy answer to the question. It's just kind of reading a lot and making judgment calls based on the knowledge that I've accrued. So I would say that like your your passion and devotion in the material really comes through, but also the work that you're creating, big fan. Thank you. Um, and I just wonder, like it's like it's obvious that you've found your thing at least for now, and like the flow must happen. But I also miss you when you're on your breaks, and so <laughs> like. Um, I just do it until it's done. So um, I don't do anything else. Um, I don't have another job. And um, I, you know, this, this is like, I think maybe the third sort of in-person thing I've done since 2020. Mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't really leave the computer much during the day. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, you know, I think that, I think you were asking a question earlier that maybe implied that I would 
kind of get into a groove and like get better at doing the research over time. And I actually <laughs> think I, I've gotten worse. Um, it's like it's harder every season. It t every season takes longer than the last season. And I don't know if it's, you know, it's like being an addict and, you know, you have to take more of the drug to feel something. <laughs> it might, there might be an element of like years ago, I was more satisfied with knowing less and now I need to know more. I'm not sure, but um, I do know that I have to keep asking for more time to produce the episodes because I just keep feeling like I need to do more. There's a, is there a greater drive then for comprehensiveness in a way? Mm -hmm. Because I think that, you know, like as you said, there was a, in the beginning there was not a sense of, you know, how comprehensive it needed to be and it could be uh, determined by what was maybe striking your fancy or what, what that kind of, like idea was that you know was stimulating further research and just maybe dropping an episode there but but now it seems like especially with you know the, one of the things that was super impressive about erotic 80s was its thoroughness you know and 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 I think that that season in particular especially for me as a gender studies professor feels very teachable mm -hmm. as an entry point not only to the films of that period but also to some of the cinema studies and critical theory of that period, the citation of Linda Williams at the beginning. So it seems like the, the kind of breadth of texts that you're including, you know, I kind of made a joke about just like talking about the magazines and the ads and what have you, um, but, but the breadth of texts that are being included now is like, it's, it's real deep cultural labor. It's really, yeah, there's definitely more sources. And part of that has to do with the fact that there is, there are not very many books about these movies or, mm -hmm. you know, they're, there have been seasons where, like as a starting point, for instance, Joan Crawford. There's a lot of books about Joan Crawford. <laughs> you know, you read like eight books about Joan Crawford and you're kind of set, mm -hmm. like for research of, for the season. You know, you can read about, you can read contemporary articles, you can read um, stuff about directors like Nicholas Ray that she worked with, but really the, the job there is to read every book about Joan Crawford, make some decisions about what you can believe and what you can't, and and compare and contrast that information and watch all the movies. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to erotic 80s, you know, there, um, there isn't a book. You know, there's, there's a couple of books about individual films or individual filmmakers, but really every episode I have to go and kind of go to these primary documents and, and read, read every review myself um, and all of that. Given all of that research then, do you consider transposing your scripts for these seasons into a book? I'd love to do that, but my feedback that I've gotten from the book world is that <laughs> no one will buy a book if they've already listened to the podcast for free. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a book agent anymore. Um, I parted ways with my last book agent because he didn't like any of my ideas. <laughs> um, so I, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think that I've, I've kind of avoided trying to sell a book since my last book. Um, partially because that book didn't sell very well, and so I don't think I'm a very attractive commodity, um, but also because I do think it would be kind of like that book where it's like I have to take time out of the podcast to do it because I can't really use the podcast to generate the material. Well, it, the, the podcast is extremely teachable in and of itself because mm -hmm. of the work that it does, although the idea of having scripts to cite, mm -hmm. right, um, I guess it, I it do would make be those for, available on Patreon as it's well. True, those are available <laughs> on Patreon, um, but 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 that's a sort of a kind of nichey thing mm -hmm. for I guess the scholar or the, the researcher mm -hmm. who's who's going to look to your work to do their own research in some way, right? So mm -hmm. so um, it's good to know that. Um, and I did I think I vaguely remember that that the scripts were available and you can kind of check them out. Um, and are, are they are they exact transcriptions of what is read? In, um, no, I, no, because they are what I am reading when mm. I'm recording. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, sometimes while I'm recording, I'll move a couple of words around or something. Okay. Um, but pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing wildly different. Yeah. OK. Um, I think that I'm getting a signal that we are. Oh, sure. Let's take a couple of questions from the live stream. Or does anybody just want to read them to us? Elliot, you want to? Because I don't have a device. Uh, 
I don't really like to talk about contemporary cinema because my husband's a filmmaker. And so <laughs> I, I have enormous levels of conflict of interest. The next question from online. Do we have any others? Somebody asked me so I can't ask the question. <laughs> ah. Okay. No, no, not at all. Um, I, again, like I, I started with the 80s. I kind of always wanted to do something called erotic 80s. I had thought it, it was going to be a book, but again, there's all these reasons why um, I'm just not really pitching books right now. Um, and it doesn't make that much sense for me to do, so, if I have an idea, it makes more sense for me to do it as a podcast because in the podcast, I have um, total control and total freedom and I have a built-in audience. And so it's, um, you know, that's, that's the reason to do it as a podcast instead of a book. But um, certainly, I, I feel like there's so, one of the things that excites me about the history of Hollywood is that there are so many movies that I still haven't seen. Um, and there are decades that I, you know, I think the 50s are so fascinating. I was able to talk about some aspects of that when I talked about Dean Martin. But um, there are so many things that I would still love to talk about. Mm-hmm. Laura. Yeah. So So I don't really pay that much attention to that. The people who sell ads, you know, they'll do surveys and stuff to Whatever, yeah. find demographics. But when I'm making the show, I don't, I don't pay attention to that at all. I just kind of, do, I express what I want to express and what interests me. If there are no further questions in person or online, <laughs> nobody else. Okay. Please thank Karina for joining us this afternoon. I also wanted to thank uh, the consortium staff, Artemisa Clark, and our graduate research assistant, Elliot Dunn, for all of their help with this. And of course, for, to the Levin Institute for the Humanities for their co-sponsorship, USC Libraries for the space. Um, and thank you all for coming. All right. Thank you. Of course. Here, let me, let's turn these mics yeah. off.